Good morning again and welcome to today's webinar provided by Solar Plaza as a prequel to our conference and exhibition Solar O&M North America uh, that will take place on March 25 and 26 in uh, San Francisco. My name is uh, Stefano Krukel. I am at Solar Plaza since 2010 and currently as a project manager responsible for the O&M events we are organizing. To give you an idea about what you can expect in the coming hour, I'll quickly run you through the uh, agenda for this webinar. Um, so I'll be moderating this session today and in a minute I'll give you a short introduction to Solar Plaza and the upcoming event Solar O&M North America. As you can see in the agenda, our first uh, speaker will be Cedric Breho, or sorry, Chamba. He will share his insights on definitions, scope, and potential of O&M in uh, North America. Thereafter, Robert Fatischer of Meteor Control will uh, discuss the five do's and uh, let's say the five don'ts regarding monitoring and data analysis. And the last speaker uh, will be uh, Rue Phillips of True South Renewables. He will share with us uh, the five main causes for a decrease of plant performance. And uh, after these speeches and presentations, we should end up with more than enough time left for an interesting panel discussion in which you can uh, also ask your uh, questions. We hope to close the, the webinar around 10. Before we start, a few practical notes. Um, yes, you will receive the sheets and recordings of the presentations afterwards. And looking to my colleague, also the recordings, correct? Perfect. Any questions you might have uh, during the presentations, you can ask them through the chat box on the right side of your screen. Uh, please feel free to already type them in during the, the presentation, also later on during the panel discussion, uh, so that I can ask them to the presenters. We'll have short time after each presentation for a few questions, and uh, most of the questions we'll discuss in the panel discussion at the end of this webinar. In case you have any technical issues, just use the chat box on the right, and my colleague is here for technical support, and he will uh, hopefully help you out. As I said, a short introduction about Solar Plaza for the people that do not know us. Uh, we are a PV-focused global information platform. As you can see, our mission is empowering professionals in uh, solar business development. We are building the most valuable solar PV network worldwide. That's what we are working on. We are founded in 2004. So this year we hope to celebrate our 10th anniversary and so far we've been organizing more than 50 conferences and trade missions as you can see in around 20 countries all over the world. Since last year uh, we are setting up a line of solar O&M events dedicated to solar O&M and asset management. We started in October in Italy with a conference Solar O&M Italy and as you can see in March, Solar O&M North America, and we will extend this line with again Solar O&M Europe and working now on the event in Asia, start of next year. Talking about the conference Solar O&M Italy of last October, here you can see um, a few testimonials of the people that attended there. Um, based on the success of this event and the, the, the value we could concretely add, the feedback we got and what we learned as an organizer, uh, we decided to launch this event also on the North Euro American market. Um, and this will be in March 25 and 26, as I mentioned. So why attending Solar O&M North America, uh, the event coming up in a month? Um, this is a two-day conference and exhibition completely dedicated to O&M and asset management of PV plants. So that we be diverse to the point, concrete topics that will be discussed all within this scope. So it's not a side session of a big conference, it's not a, a small event, it's a two full day conference and exhibition on this topic. So you'll meet all your potential partners and customers there. Um, the whole chain will be present from O&M related service providers to asset managers, IPPs, utilities, project developers, EPCs, manufacturers, investors, and obviously plant owners. You'll learn from the top experts when you see the program on the website I'll mention later on. And of course, this is the opportunity to share and discuss in depth uh, the strategies, expertise, and experience you have with asset management and O&M. 
The program at the conference is as follows. You can see it's a two-day event with four sessions, and in these sessions there are several speeches and panel discussions. Um, I'll not go in depth to it right now. You can read it through later on. You can see the topics are diverse, all in the scope of O&M and asset management. We thank our sponsors so far uh, of the conference also for making this webinar possible. Uh, Meteor Control, True South Renewables, Electris, Synaptic Q and First Solar as gold sponsors, and CSD Nano as exhibition sponsor, Fier Axiom as basic sponsor, and our content partners for the event, Green Tech Media and the SunSpec Alliance. Here see a few companies, some of the companies that are already joining to get an impression. I would propose to just start with the first speaker of today of the webinar, as I mentioned already, Cedric Bro. He is Managing Director of Solichama Consulting, an independent, independent consultancy, and he's very experienced in O&M and monitoring. Today he will discuss the definitions, scope, and potential of O&M in North America. Cedric, I'm now going to make you presenter and mute myself, um, so I hope you're ready, and please go ahead. Hello everyone, so it seems like you can hear me now. Um, so let's get this presentation up. Here it is. So uh, let's talk about O&M and first I want to start with a uh, definition. What is O&M? Um, it's, a, it's a set of activities and it's important to say that they, are, they tend to be technical in nature um, as opposed to asset management which is more financial. And um, O&M simply enables the power plants to perform. And what, the, what performing means is really producing energy. And there's also a compliance aspect to it, um, whether it's you know, health and safety, uh, grid uh, integration requirements, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so O&M sometimes is seen, uh, actually often, as a subset of asset management. Um, other opinions uh, are that it, it, those are two separate uh, functions that are sitting side by side, but most commonly you can consider that O&M is a subset of asset management. And um, to make the picture a little more blurred, um, many times the services that O&M firms offer um, venture into the domain of asset management. So it's, th there are clear definitions of both, but practically speaking, the, the intersection is, is sub often defined, often uh, blurred. So let's look at the scope to illustrate uh, this. Here I, in this diagram, um, you can see different areas, operations on the top, maintenance at the bottom, asset management on the right, and then engineering, which is kind of a standalone piece that is uh, connected um, in different ways. Um, so let's look at the activities first in the domain of operations. Um, obviously, there's monitoring and supervision, but also increasingly, and especially for larger plants, there are grid integration and regulation functions that, that also fit into that operations domain. And reporting. Um, so at the intersection of the operations and, at the, and the maintenance domain, you can see the corrective maintenance activities because uh, not only you need boots on the ground to go fix things, but you also need the intelligence to detect remotely uh, that there is a problem to fix. So that's why the, this box is, is in uh, both domains. And uh, predictive maintenance, which is a bit of a buzzword, but um, it really consists in, in having the intelligence to uh, predict issues before they occur, and so to take action uh, in, in anticipation. Uh, at the, on the bottom side of the chart with the maintenance, you can see a lot of activities, which are the ones people typically think of uh, when, it, when it comes to uh, O&M, and it goes through all the uh, electrical, uh, mechanical maintenance, as well as uh, site maintenance, module cleaning, uh, controlling vegetation, which can actually be a large part of the, of the cost um, of an O&M contract and things that people think less of, like road or fence maintenance, and in some countries and, and uh, environments, environmental protection and compensation measures as well. You can see on the right side, asset management, um, everything that's about managing warranties, guaranteeing levels of production, also interfacing with local authorities, grid operators, et cetera, et cetera insurance, incentives, anything that's financial and administrative in nature. And at the bottom right, you can see engineering because um, 
as, as, as my colleagues are going to show in the next parts of the presentation, some plants, not all plants are built the same. And uh, there are scenarios in which uh, recommissioning may be required. You may want to have quality auditing and sometimes upgrading of the plant itself or the monitoring system. So we don't have much time, so let's move into uh, market sizing. Uh, looking at what's, uh, what's happened in the past few years, you can see that North America now has reached about um, 6.75 gigawatts at the end of, the, of 2013. And that's cumulative. It's important because um, we in the solar industry tend to look at the market as you know, only the, the amount of new construction in a particular year. But when you look at ONM, any plant that was built needs to be operated in, uh, or at least maintained. So um, it is the cumulative install that matters. And just to be clear, this particular slide focuses on the, uh, what is called the megawatt scale uh, PV, which is any plant above one megawatt. So you can see that the, the, the North American market has been growing uh, pretty fast and also uh, increasing its share in, in the global mix. Looking forward um, at what is going to happen um, or what is projected to happen uh, between now and 2017, and these are our GTM research numbers, the North American O&M market is expected to grow to reach about 22 gigawatts by 2017 um, and increase its, its share of the global market, not dramatically, but still going up from 13 to 14 and a half percent. And the reason why it's not getting a bigger share, it's because of the extreme growth projections that we have for Asia. Now, a quick look at the, the competitive landscape and who the vendors are. Um, of course, project developers and EPCs build the plants, and many of them are also interested in offering operations and maintenance for these same plants. Uh, and sometimes uh, for third-party plants as well. Utilities and IPPs have a traditional background of um, operating power generation assets, and uh, many of them also extend these activities to solar power plants. Of course, the vertically integrated solar firms, the big ones like those First Solar, Sun Edison, Sun Power, et cetera, part of their vertical integration strategy is to also offer the services, including the O&M. Uh, inverter manufacturers, um, not all of them have um, O&M activities, but some do, um, most notably uh, Schneider Electric, mostly in Europe, as well as SMA in North America, do offer full plant uh, O&M services. And last but not least, the independent O&M providers. Practically unheard of three years ago, uh, but uh, now a fast-growing segment of the market. Um, these companies are focused on O&M and will um, oftentimes take over the management of power plants um, after the initial warranty periods, but increasingly also uh, they can be the provider right from the start of the plant. Final slide, let's look at the, the competitive landscape and, and, and on this uh, graphical picture, you can see the size of each of these players uh, represents the, uh, the, the amount of megawatts that they were managing in the middle of last year. And then the color scheme shows what kind of company they are. Um, and the, the vertical horizontal scale shows um, if they're uh, more geared towards their own plants at the bottom uh, and, or geared towards managing third-party plants at the top of the scale. And then on the left is more local providers and on the right are uh, global providers. So as you can see on this, a lot of the bigger uh, dots here are some of the vertically integrated companies as well as the very large EPCs. Um, and, um, and large inverter manufacturers. But what you also see is that there are a number of independent ones, and these are the darker dots here, including um, True South Renewables and Media Control, um, whose representatives are going to be speaking in the webinar today. And one of the big trends that we see is that there's an increased number of these independent owner providers, and they're increasingly big as well, um, gaining traction in the marketplace. That's it for now. Um, I will uh, answer questions. Um, I'm sure this, there will be some because I, I had to go really fast. Stefano uh, asked me to do this quickly. Thank you very much. One last comment. You can get more information from a uh, research report from GTM Research. Um, there's over 200 pages of analysis, and uh, some of the charts that you've seen today were uh, excerpts from this uh, material. Thank you, Cedric, also for staying within the time frame and for sharing this uh, overview. 
Um, we'll do one short question right now, uh, and obviously there will be also more questions for you during the panel discussion. Um, Brittany asks uh, the following question. I see that Canada was not represented in the last bar graph. Um, are you considering North America as inclusive of Canadian entities, or is it just the U.S.? Can you comment on this? Yes, of course. Um, so the numbers that I included, the 6.75 and the 22 gigawatts by 2017, are for North America. Uh, the bar chart that you saw includes is a country by country bar chart. So in that uh, bar chart, the the gray portion was the U.S. only without Canada. But in the 6.75 and the 22, Canada is included. Thank you. Okay, as I mentioned, we'll for now just go through to the next presenter. Uh, plenty of time afterwards for, for questions. Thanks again, Cedric, and uh, we'll hear you back in, uh, in about half an hour. I'll just uh, mute you now. Um. Our next speaker, as mentioned before, is uh, Robert Fassischer of Meteor Control. Uh, he's Managing Director of Meteor Control, a uh, global leading uh, monitoring service provider and also O&M provider, as we just saw from uh, Cedric's introduction. Robert, you will discuss with us today the five do's and the five most common mistakes regarding monitoring and data analysis. Um, I'll unmute you in one second, so I'll say, please go ahead. Thank you, Stefano, for your kind introduction. I'm just starting the presentation. Thank you. You can see it? I can see it. I assume okay. all of us can. So I hope all of you can see it. Uh, yes, I would like to talk about some do's and don'ts in PV projects. Um, first, just to give you some facts about the company made to control, as already mentioned, we are a uh, monitoring provider but also offering quality services regarding PV projects. So we can show uh, more than 30 years of experience in renewable energy systems and regarding monitoring we are a market leader in the professional sector with a total installed power of over 8.5 gigawatts. This uh, represents the biggest data pool of performance data of PV systems. And regarding quality uh, services, we have been involved up till now in projects covering a total investment of more than 12 billion euros. You can see our offices uh, headquartered here in Germany, but uh, also some offices in Europe, um, an office in, in the Bay Area near San Francisco, Meteo Control North America, and my colleague Lisa Known will also take part in the Solar Plaza event uh, next week. Regarding our products and services, we try to cover all uh, phases of a PV project, starting in the planning phase with bankable yield reports, consulting technical due diligence, but also construction phase uh, regarding construction supervision and technical acceptance, and also covering long-term operation phase with our core business offering monitoring solutions so we are offering the tools also for monitoring and providing O&M but especially for customers without the technical background we are also offering the service taking over responsibility of systems and right now we have about 500 megawatts on the contract which, uh, which is a good basis for, for doing this business. Also, one step further, there are solar power forecasts, which I will give you some information about uh, in the later pages. Um, reg regarding international, uh, international use of our products, you can see the capital cities of, of the countries where our products and services are used. So, you see it's, it's becoming a global business and, of course, we have to think about how to approach this international market. So, let's come to the do's in, in PV projects. 
First, of course, you have to secure your yield in the planning phase. Second, you have to verify design and estimations. You have to check your contracts. You have to supervise construction and technical acceptance. And you have to consider proper DB monitoring. Securing yield in the planning phase is depending on the right components. So modules, substructure, cabling, inverters, grid connection, monitoring but also on the system design, the system layout, keeping limits of inverters, uh, thinking of, of um, system design regarding module power versus uh, inverter, uh, inverter power, but also simple things like shading, as you can see in these examples. If you don't consider shading in the design phase, you end up with systems providing data like this and in the end the investor, the owner of the system loses money. Second, verify design and estimations. Sometimes um, EPCs and project, especially project developers, come up with very optimistic projections of their uh, energy yield. So um, we strongly recommend to, to verify these calculations and to, to order a bankable yield report with a reliable evaluation of irradiation data with a precise simul system simulation and also backed up with a validation of real operational data to provide a reliable yield report accepted by banks and also investors. And we did some evaluations of our reports versus real operational data and we can summarize that an accuracy of about plus minus two percent is achievable if you have the correct system information, if the true real installed power is, is according to the nominal power and if, if you can evaluate high quality measurements uh, regarding sensors and energy meters. Next step is to check your contracts. You have to, uh, to think about the EPC and also the L&M contracts, especially also the technical issues. There has to be a clearly defined scope of work. There has to be a realistic time schedule, defined milestones and payments, and you have to define guarantees, but also with boundary conditions in the contracts. Discussions after closing the contract are very are very difficult, and uh, it's it's better for both sides to to already fix it in the contract phase. And of course, with both contracts, EPC and O and M, the quality control chain has to be defined, and also the consequences have to be defined if some specifications are not met. One example regarding EPC contract is, mod is, module, um, is uh, module power. I just get a message here. Uh, let's, let's check it. Um, a very, very simple question at the first sight. Uh, what's, what's the defined module power? What has to be defined in the contract? But also here you can see it's data sheet or flash value or is it uh, AC power of inverters regarding the, 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 uh, the grid capacity and even with the module power you have to, to um, define um, additional parameters like uh, number of microcracks which are acceptable, which samples are measured in laboratory or field and what are the consequences if tolerances or specifications are not met. Like in this uh, example, you see the blue line that's representing the nominal capacity of 240 watts. You see the, the green line which is representing the flash test values of the manufacturer and you see the red line which is representing the sample measurements in the laboratory. So, so um, you see um, there is a difference and you have to care about these differences because it will influence your plant performance in the end. 
Coming to the construction phase, um, we strongly recommend to do a, a supervision of the construction and also to establish a technical acceptance in the end, so that there's a quality control during construction, that there is a on-site presence on behalf of the investor, and um, it makes sense that a technical expert acts as a, an interface between investor and EPC contractor. Um, of course, at the end of construction or startup phase, um, uh, with a technical acceptance, you have to verify if all project specifications have been kept, if all the EPC protocols can be verified, and you have to add some detailed measurements on site, like IV curves, um, thermography, and electroluminescence. Here you just see some examples of what we have seen in some projects. You see the cables on the ground. Obviously, that's not the best way to handle them. Here you see some water in the tubes, which will also cause some problems, at least after some years of operation. And obviously, also, this is not a high-quality uh, mounting structure for, for 20 years of operation. Coming to the next point, to consider proper monitoring. So it's not only the modules and inverters. You also have to take care of the monitoring system. I'm pretty sure you all know some schemes like this, um, the central data logger where all the values on site are, are stored, are recorded, energy meter values, inverter values, transformer messages, sensors like irradiance, temperature, and wind. This data is transferred to a central database on a server. In our case, as meter control, we are also combining it with satellite-based irradiance data and, and uh, additional weather data to be able also to do overall uh, evaluations. And the customer and operators, they can access their data, they can access their system by just using the internet. Considering proper monitoring um, means that monitoring is adapted to project requirements. So if you think of professional, even utility scale systems, you have to see, uh, make sure that irradiation is measured with high quality pyranometers. Maybe you also add some reference cells to get the different uh, spectral response. Um, you need to, to get also connection to the, to the energy meters, uh, especially um, uh, the ones uh, also used for the feed-in calculation by the utility. If possible, you should ex be able to access inverter values and also to access or to, to, um, to monitor uh, strings on, on single string level, but also maybe on zone level. There are some do's, but of course there also are some don'ts. So we strongly recommend do not rely on manufacturer statements only. Do not believe a PV plant doesn't need maintenance. Do not underestimate the financial impact of professional O&M. Do not forget the requirements of the grid operator. And do not miss the benefits of solar power forecasts. So relying on manufacturer statements is dangerous because um, you see, even certifications like IEC are not enough because they are just giving you the result of a sample test. So to secure multi-megawatt projects, an evaluation not only of the product but also of the process is required. This can be done by an on-site appointment in the factory and um, with a detailed evaluation of the quality assurance. Of course, as already mentioned, there are detailed measurements you can do also on site. IV curves done on site, but also in the laboratory. Thermographic uh, images, which can be uh, performed by 100% checking of operating systems. 
but also electroluminescence um, measurements, pictures, which usually are done in the laboratory, but there are upcoming new approaches to make it also possible in the field. And this gives you a very reliable insight into the system and if the system meets the quality uh, requirements of your project. Sometimes um, PV systems are sold as maintenance free. Um, this is of course not true. They are not maintenance free. Uh, you have to care about your system and we did uh, an evaluation, you can see in 2011, and we came up with the result that the plant has on average 5 to 10 events of incidents per year. This does not mean that there are 5 to 10 breakdowns, but there are incidents which uh, you have to care about. So, you see there is a small number of plant malfunctions, but of course this has a big impact on your energy loss. On the other hand, there are communication problems, you have to take care of them, but they not uh, uh, cause energy losses in every case. And you can see that the inverter is still the weakest part of the system, so that's really one point to take care of. In addition, you can see uh, a lot of effects on site, shading, soiling, hotspots, even fire in, in electrical housings. And just to give you some examples, um, at first sight you, you would, you would uh, see everything's okay, there's a system, maybe some grass, but the, the string uh, currents, they look pretty, pretty okay. And uh, just two days later, you see there's there's a really a small tolerance, so the string currents look even better. And what happened? You you may see just in front of the modules, they just cut the first the first meter in front of the modules, and they had this effect from this tolerance here to this tolerance here. And obviously, even if uh, even w when you can just can't see any f effect by this grass, even the this small, small, um, small growing vegetation already causes energy losses. And next example is taking care of uh, um, taking care of soiling. You see. Here you get some some um, energy curves of inverters, and on the first side everything's okay. 20th of April, uh, all inverters are performing the same way, so no problem at first sight. Just a few days later, you can see two inverters are performing about 10, 30 percent less. So of course you would ask what happened, and there was just some cleaning, so not two inverters did perform less, but the one did perform on the, on the level he should perform. So, in the end, uh, the investor of this system lost money because of not proper O&M service, because of not uh, cleaning these uh, subsystems on time. But of course, this strongly depends on location and all the surrounding conditions. Um, O&M causes costs, causes efforts, but also gives you back return. We did an evaluation of several systems without professional monitoring, without fast reaction times, but also with professional monitoring and fast reaction times. And you can see the mean PR shows about 4% difference. So, uh, professional service also pays, pays off. Okay. Coming to, to the next points, um, requirements of grid operators. In Germany, we have a big amount of PV already installed, so there are growing um, requirements from grid operators, but also from energy traders, and you have to 
react on the requirements like active power control, reactive power control, ramp up and ramp down limits, and also regarding forecasting of energy generation. And this is my last point. Um, solar energy, solar power is predictable and you can get uh, forecast day ahead up to 96 hours, but also intraday up to 5 hours and then 15 minute resolutions. And this gives a very good basis for integrating solar power into the grid. So that's from Meta Control. Thank you all for listening and I'm awaiting your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Robert, for this uh, very interesting uh, presentation and sharing these, these graphs, these insights. Uh, we take time for one question now. Uh, let me make a selection. Um, question from uh, John. He mm -hmm. says a 2% accuracy forecast yield versus real seems more mm -hmm. accurate than we have seen. Mm -hmm. The variance of weather and sun temperature and especially snow soiling seems to vary more than a 2% year over year. Is your 2% mm -hmm. including weather variances? No, of course, uh, coming to this tolerance, you have to consider the, the variation of irradiance and, and weather. So uh, when doing a validation of your, of your reports, of your yield predictions, you have to consider the actual weather situation in this operating period. So it's not only um, on my uh, yield report regarding the long-term mean, I get, let's say, 1,500 kilowatt hours per kilowatt peak, and in 2013, I just got 1,400. You also have to uh, consider the variation in irradiation, in temperature, and also outages, breakdowns of components. But if these uh, parameters are considered, the the right way, and if um, if the system performs the way it was uh, simulated, then you can get to the to this very close uh, tolerance of about two percent. Okay, thank you for uh, for commenting. There are some more questions. We'll go to them uh, straight after the the next speaker. Uh, Rue Phillips, CEO of True South Renewables. Uh, the, one leading independent O&M provider in the U.S. Real, you will um, share with us the five main causes based on your ex extensive experience for decree decrease of plant performance. Um, please go ahead and try to stick to time so that we have time for the panel discussion uh, afterwards. Go ahead. Thank you, Stefano. I will indeed stick to time uh, and uh, try and make some time for slides afterwards. Uh, first of all, I, I hope uh, wherever everybody is calling in from, the sun is shining. <laughs> and uh, thank you for joining the panel. Very exciting. Um, I've got uh, some very important issues I want to share with you as far as uh, the five key components of uh, issues which result in negative performance. Uh, I'll give a, a five-second uh, overview of myself and my company. I'm the CEO and co-founder of True South Renewables. Uh, we are considered the USA's largest independent solar O&M company, and uh, we touch in some way and we dispatch daily across the United States technicians and managers on over a gigawatts of systems performing services from preventative maintenance, uh, owner's representation, uh, commissioning, uh, testing, and validation. And it's from that experience that I've gathered today's slideshow uh, from our technicians and boots on the ground and uh, truck rolls on what are the most, the five most offending issues that result in negative performance on solar assets. Before I do that, we have to briefly visit on how we measure those performance ratios and each one of the, the components which make up for the performance of the solar system. You can see here I've highlighted some of the, the components which are actually affected through day-to-day -day operations and maintenance through the lifetime of the plant. Other issues such as inverter and transformer losses are actually in the design component and there's not much you can do about them once the uh, COD or the, the plant has come online. So let's get deep and dirty into those five issues. 
Uh, first of all, the number one key offender is availability. Now we will go into a granular level of what affects the availability. It could be many issues from, uh, as Robert pointed out, the, the, the heart of the system, which is the inverter. But unfortunately, the inverter gets blamed for a lot of issues which cause the inverter to go offline. And we'll, we'll address some of those later on. Uh, we'll also be talking about soiling. And uh, Robert showed some great pictures of uh, how systems are often neglected. Uh, this is kind of like the low-hanging fruit, uh, pardon the pun, uh, on uh, issues regarding to performance-related uh, issues on, on solar systems. The next one is um, viruses. I call these viruses in the veins of the solar system. They are series losses through AC and DC wiring losses. They can be thermal events. They can be loose connections. They can be bad transformer losses. And I'll show you some pictures, and we'll go granular on that. A big one, buzzwords of the day uh, in the solar industry are the remediation of issues. How long it's going to take for your contractor to get out there and fix the problem, and uh, we'll address that also. Uh, Robert, I won't go into too much detail of this because Robert very eloquently uh, described uh, the aspects of monitoring and how important, but I will slightly address on how uh, they affect the dispatching of technicians and how important of a role that is into the O&M protocol of your, your asset. And finally, uh, what an O&M o &M, o &M protocol is. That is the, the, the key offender, the most common issue that we see is they're just neglect of their assets. So let's go into availability and in the, the, on a granular level, obviously number one is the inverter. Uh, is it on or is it off? Um, over 300 watts per square meter, we consider the system should be buzzing and uh, generating power. Uh, any one of a hundred issues within the BOS could cause this inverter to go offline. And one of those key ones is uh, ground faults. Um, the ground fault on the system will cause a 500 kilowatt or a one megawatt inverter to go, go down offline. And we'll, we'll take a, a quick look at some of the pictures and what causes that. Medium voltage, this is relating to utility scale systems. Um, when I say medium voltage, I'm talking of a 12 kV, 12,000 volts, 36,000 volts. Uh, these are rare, but when they do occur, they are usually pretty serious to the impact of the performance. Uh, medium voltage transformers, um, anywhere in the world, they're not off the shelf. And if you don't have a spare and an inventory, they will uh, negatively affect the impact of that performance. Up to 1 megawatt, 1 1.5 megawatt. Vandalism and accidents, um, again, my company touches over a gigawatt of uh, uh, PV systems, and we see uh, trucks uh, run into carports, uh, kids turn DC disk and X off, common component. Remediation of faults, if the system is offline and your contractor, it takes five days uh, to go to the site, then your system is considered not available for whatever component of the system is down. Monitoring and metering, uh, obviously uh, a sophisticated and a comprehensive or moreover a reliable monitoring uh, protocol, uh, as mentioned with Medio Control, uh, is, is an absolute must on any, any solar asset. And um, also design issues. Uh, uh, I, I think both Robert and Cedric mentioned the importance of an O&M protocol, not just at the end of the solar system when it comes online, but actually in the engineering and the design of the system. And once again, that plug, whoever you choose for your O&M, please choose an O&M protocol. No O&M o &M protocol is, is the most common that we see. And uh, it's, it's kind of silly to spend millions of dollars on these assets and, uh, and not have an O&M protocol. Some quick examples of pictures uh, of Availability impact. Uh, what you're seeing here on the left is the result of a burned out um, combiner box uh, DC disconnect. Probably 100 kilowatts here that's offline. This was uh, started off as a thermal event and obviously went into an open circuit. Uh, availability could be on a modular level, which takes a string out. Uh, that one string, 3 kilowatts, 3 or 4 kilowatts, is, is now not available on this system. And this is, these problems actually show up before they go into an open circuit. 
is another catastrophic fault which would be picked up by an annual preventative maintenance protocol before it goes to open circuit. Uh, again, I'll state this could be a 60 or 100 kilowatt subcomponent of a, a 1 megawatt system, which is no longer available. So let's say this was a 600 kilowatt solar system, and this combiner box or this splice here was 100 uh, kW of that. 10% availability is now underperforming. Next in line is soiling. Uh, there's been some mention uh, uh, of soiling and the impact of it. We've actually seen uh, up to 40% degradation from soiling. As you can see some uh, pictures here, uh, these are pretty common what we see. Rooftop uh, soiling is a common uh, occurrence. Uh, obviously, uh, unless you have uh, a comprehensive O&M protocol, nobody's going to go on the roof. Um, this would be picked up uh, again by a sophisticated and a reliable monitoring. Uh, the problem with this particular, this was a six million dollar, and whether you can see my mouth, mouth move, six million dollar asset soiled by uh, seagulls, and the seagulls had actually soiled over the irradiance meters. So, uh, uh, you know, remotely this was looked upon as if the the plant was underperforming. Carports, um, typical. This was uh, this is in California. Uh, one megawatt system, 40% deficient in its performance uh, due to this. Uh, here we see a utility plant, which is 30%. Some contentious um, dialogue going on of whether, especially in California right now with the drought that we have, of whether these 30, 50, 100 megawatt plants actually um, efficiently pan out uh, you know, whether it's to wash or to not to wash, uh, whether the economics actually work, I can actually say they do. Uh, series losses are caused by module defects, cell defects, source wiring, uh, obviously this is from a string or a, a module wiring. BOS to inverter can include uh, hotspots in combiner boxes, splices, terminations, um, again terminations throughout the whole system. A, a good comprehensive O&M protocol would see these splices being checked on an annual basis. Uh, my company checks every termination, every splice in the systems on a goal level O&M preventative uh, throughout the system. Mechanical, uh, this would relate to uh, single axis and dual axis trackers. Uh, also the, the mechanics of the racking system components on rooftop systems especially. And I saw some pictures earlier, great pictures, poor installation methods. Uh, I would put that down to the system wasn't commissioned correctly or the owner's representation uh, wasn't uh, on the site looking after the assets. And uh, indeed, once again, no O&M protocol um, will result in any one of uh, these line item losses. Remediation of issues, uh, again, is a hot topic in the solar O&M uh, industry. Uh, in the timely dispatch of service technicians uh, through assets, uh, my company is uh, uh, very fortunate to, to have over four or five hundred uh, sites that we dispatch technicians to, and um, we can do that reliably uh, by uh, interacting with a, a, a comprehensive and reliable monitoring company like Medio Control. Uh, O&M and monitoring go hand in hand. They're, there's not either one that could replace the other. They, they are both an asset. Uh, warranty administration is a very important part of, of operations and maintenance. Um, in the instance where a combiner box is burned out, um, your EPC or your uh, O&M contractor would gladly replace the, the part, but uh, who's going to pay for the warranty for the replacement part? That's, uh, that's very important. And, uh, uh, the number one that uh, I'm an advocate for uh, that as far as uh, reaching out to the O&M community is having a budget for the repairs and having a budget for, for operations and maintenance. Uh, far too often we try to back into a non-existent budget on um, a vague scope of work. Spare parts inventory, going back again to the medium voltage transformers on the utility scale uh, listeners and developers. Uh, it's very important to have critical components and spare parts. Uh, training uh, of the service techs, having them authorized to work on any one of the components within your solar asset. Documentation from engineering and commissioning is very important to the timely dispatch and the remediation. I'd say that I'd put that on a, a, a number one actually. 
and again, no O&M protocol is a number one offender uh, for this. Monitoring, I'm, I'm going to go quickly over this because, uh, again, Robert did such an eloquent job of describing um, how the industry should approach that. Uh, the granularity of the monitoring is very important. Um, Previously and historically, the developers and engineers would just put a kilowatt hour meter, and the only interest that would be to see the accumulated KWH on a daily, weekly, and monthly. Um, I would profess that we need to go more granular and um, spend a little bit more time and emphasis on the design and engineering, which will result in the reliability of dispatching uh, O&M technicians uh, and the, the, the alarm situations. Annual calibration is very important to, to uh, put into your O&M uh, scope of work. Um, again, I point back to the $6 million asset with the, the seagulls. Uh, if had the, even the monitoring system been checked on an annual basis, it would have been found uh, that the, um, the solar asset was majorly underperforming. Asset management, uh, again, is tied uh, directly with uh, monitoring and dispatching of the technicians. Um, so to review, system availability being the number one offender of uh, solar uh, O&M and the, the most common issues, again, which are cause for granularity of uh, severe um, impacts to the system caused by soiling, and wiring losses, and remediation of issues. How quick can we fix the problem? Monitoring, again, most important component within your solar system should be part uh, of the design and installation. Uh, in summary, the, the low solar system performance is most often caused by the negative impact uh, due to lack of implementation of a proven prevented O&M protocol and standards. Um, uh, hats off, uh, applauds Solar Plaza for this great uh, seminar and symposium and convention that's coming up which addresses purely O&M within the solar industry which has been overlooked for decades. Um, I'd like to thank you all, um, again, joining uh, the, the uh, team of the panelists for questions, but for five seconds I'd like to go over some of the, the, the better quality pictures of uh, some of the ones that I was showing, showing earlier. Uh, this is your $6 million solar plant um, with seagulls. As you can see, it took three times the wash on the left-hand side to, 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 to wash those. Here's a close-up of that $6 million asset. And what's interesting about this picture here is these seagulls uh, were to nest, they own that $6 million asset. If, this, uh, if you neglect the, these rooftop systems, they become a bird sanctuary. So they're very difficult uh, to mitigate uh, once they, they, they start nesting. Soiling and obviously uh, a scheduled wash, um, economically feasible, and it, it's actually proven that this part of the, the, the maintenance pays off. Uh, as you can see, some industrial rooftop applications in Europe, these are, are becoming more common, and uh, in Germany I, I know there's gigawatts of these, so uh, I, I'm sure there, if the Europeans have a, a proven O&M protocol, which we're adopting here in the United States. Um, on that, Stefano, I'll hand it over to you and uh, um, open up for questions. Thank you very much. Thanks to Yuru for, uh, for sharing this. Great presentation and also the last slides very illustrative. Um, well, you also mentioned soiling uh, and cleaning as a, a key um, a key element, a key problem. So let's start with a direct question to you from Alan uh, regarding soiling. He asked, "Do you have a cost-benefit analysis in terms of establishing when and if washing or cleaning panels is beneficial?" We do indeed. Um, my team has done a study on the, both the DG, uh, the distributed generation assets that we have under management and operation, and also the utility scale. And we do have a, a, a white paper study on that. And we can actually say that to wash a system um, on a scheduled basis actually has an economic benefit. And we can actually, I'd, I'd be willing to share. Uh, if, uh, if you want to gather the uh, information from the recipients, Stefano, I'd be willing to share that, uh, that study on uh, when to wash and the economics of such. Okay, yes, we, we will and people can via us uh, directly obtain that. It won't be a problem or directly. Um, thank you, Ru. Uh, let's go to the, the next question. 
Um, the, the question from Mike is, and this question is for both you, Ru, and uh, Robert, so I'd like a, a short answer from both of you. The question is, can you provide some rough dollar per watt estimation for the cost of O&M, let's say average numbers for small 500 kilowatt systems and for larger megawatt farms? Of course, many people will be interested. Can you, what can you tell us about this? First, uh, you, Ru, and then I would like to hear from the side of Robert. So, uh, th this is the number one question that comes up to me on, on many of the conventions. What does it cost? And the, the, the first thing I'll point out is, what is a 5 or 10 percent degradation in your performance ratio? What does that cost your uh, economic model and your forecast? So, uh, for example, if the, the True South has a gold and a silver and a bronze, uh, a bronze being a reactive, this is a reactive, the, you know, the, the picture of the seagulls. Uh, a reactive means we're going to show up once a year and we're going to take visible, uh, visual and thermographs and it's not really a performance enhancer because it's, it's an after the fact. We're, we're fixing problems. Whereas a preventative maintenance along with the a sophisticated asset management and monitoring protocol increases the performance. Uh, I would say the, the costs vary from anywhere to uh, one penny per DC watt to three pennies uh, to, per DC watt. That's 10000 per megawatt to $30,000 per megawatt. Uh, and these are vague, obviously. If you're talking about a 40 cent per kilowatt hour, uh, so it depends on geographics, it depends on these conditions here, this would be a, a lot more expensive. So but those, those are vague numbers. Uh, Robert, you want to take it from there? Yes, yeah, Robert, go but, ahead. but I, I just have to agree. Uh, it really depends on the service level. Also, we are offering different service levels, starting with basic uh, to professional, but also premium. And this can really be customized to the project requirements. And I would also say, uh, with a basic level, it starts in the range of of about five euros per kilowatt but it can go up to, to 30 euros per kilowatt when uh, cleaning and, and landscape maintenance and several on-site visits are included. So it's really a wide range and to give one number for the costs is nearly impossible. Okay, but the range you just mentioned, is it for uh, ground mounted or rooftop, let's say the 500 kilowatt project? Um, of course, ground mounted is uh, usually easier to access. Therefore, it's it's uh, sometimes cheaper in the end. But uh, this range also applies to to roof mounted systems. Okay. Thank you both. Um, third question. Uh, let's give this one to to Ru again. Is from Thomas. Um, you mentioned system availability and proper equipment etc. in order for the plan to work properly and efficiently. What part do surge protection devices play in the availability of the system and did you have any surge related problems in PV installations so far? Um, good question. Uh, surge protection we see uh, more related to utility scale uh, when you uh, put these vast um, acres of conductive materials in open areas uh, uh, such as 500 acre utility plants and uh, we get lightning, the first thing that they're going to affect is surge protectors. So yes, uh, indeed, uh, we see problems and anomalies and nuances uh, from surge protection and the lack of attention in the design. Um, distributed generation, not so much. Um, the, the, the amount of times that we see uh, DG uh, rooftop solar assets hit by lightning or, or in the, the need of surge protection. But utility scale, absolutely. Uh, I think it's, um, it's underplayed and it needs more focus in the design and uh, implementation. Thank you. Uh, a question for Robert again uh, from Peter. Robert, uh, will new storage technologies, compressed gas, fuel cells, etc., allow for predictable growth in on-grid, off-grid PV installation and marketability. Yes, of course. Um, uh, integrating storage technologies 
into these systems will help to to uh, go into new markets, to go into new applications, and it also will increase the the, the possibilities of forecasting uh, uh, energy generation. And and uh, if you think of new markets with not so stable grids and big uh, grid connected systems, you get some. Um, you get some ramp up, ramp, ramp down parameters, some limits you have to keep, and this is only possible when integrating also storage technologies. Okay, thank you, Robert. Um, I have an interesting question here for uh, both uh, Robert and Rue. Eric asks, would you advise against EPCs providing O&M services? There is a, there is a concern. Um, of conflict of interest. So, how would you react to that? Uh, first, Robert, please. Yeah. Um, yeah of course, that's uh, always a discussion because um, sometimes uh, banks and investors uh, like to have the EPC also on board when providing O&M, at least uh, the first years when also talking about warranties. Um, so. Um, uh, our proposal or our recommendation is at least to install an independent supervisor for this O&M period because otherwise the EPC controls himself and he's controlling his own guarantees and that's not the best situation. Okay. Thank you, Robert. Ryu, how would you comment on this? Um, I'm going to be cautious here because some of our largest customers are multi-billion dollar EPCs, Stefano, so, uh, uh, but, but they, they are starting to recognize and the industry is starting to recognize the need, uh, as Robert says, for the first off independent uh, commissioning and uh, owner's representation during the installation. Uh, I'd like to point out that the EPCs are, are really good and efficient at building large uh, solar systems and utility scales, and that's what they're good at. Uh, not all of them have a, a separate division for operations and maintenance, uh, longev for 20 years, uh, dispatching technicians. So my company has affiliated ourselves with the large EPCs in recognizing that let them move on to build the next system, uh, give us the keys to the plant, and we'll take care of it on their behalf and their obligations for the next 20 years. I'll give you a great example. There's some beautiful hotels in, in uh, Las Vegas, large hotels, uh, $100 million hotels. The guys that build those hotels, they don't stick around to maintain and operate it for the next 20 years. They hand the keys to uh, an efficient and reliable maintenance company. And I believe those uh, independent maintenance companies are going to be starting to become more and more commonplace in the solar industry, specifically that the financial institutions have recognized that the skill sets are different from the EPCs. Interesting. Thank you also for this interesting uh, example. Cedric, I hope you are still there as well. Um, there, there's a question for you. Um, well, and in between, I hope for the, the listeners that this, this webinar is already being a, let's say, a taste of uh, what they can expect on the, the conference. It's also very more uh, varying topics from uh, going deeper into SLA, service level agreements, plan design problems, uh, legal issues, etc. Uh, but in the meantime, um, Cedric, uh, John is asking uh, the following question. Um, you, you researched also on uh, O&M and monitoring in Europe, so you are probably uh, one of the uh, people that can best have this overview. Uh, what are the most strike the, the two or three most striking differences between O&M, how it's done in Europe, and how it's done at the moment in North America? Oh, that's a great question. There's a number of differences. Um, one of them, I would say, is that uh, there's been a strong culture in Europe of uh, giving importance to the monitoring uh, with, for example, a greater adoption of um, higher quality monitoring systems and um, string monitoring in a lot of cases. And that 
uh, those technologies have an impact on on the O and M and um, the ability to detect issues and to take action on them. That's one area. Um, another thing that I've heard uh, from European providers is is new technologies such as uh, using um, drones to uh, to do some. Um, Imaging, some thermal imaging, instead of having to walk with a with a gun uh, through through the arrays, uh, which can be very large, um, using these drones can be a, a pretty effective uh, technology. So um, those are two differences. I would say that overall, uh, it's not that much of a Europe versus America. It's really it really depends on each country and each region and each climate. You can have similarities between some parts of Italy and the U.S. in terms of the environment and the importance of cleaning and vegetation control, as opposed to uh, some parts of Germany that may be closer to the uh, to the east coast of the U.S. So uh, it really it's not that much Europe versus U.S., but it, it's more the local climate conditions and um, and the environment. I would say one aspect is that there tends to be in some parts of Europe, for uh, Italy, for example, there tends to be a heavier burden on um, uh, interfaces with local authorities and and political related aspects. Thank you. Maybe one, one maybe one last point is that uh, a structural difference as well is that uh, with the, the feed-in tariffs in Europe have, tend to be higher uh, as opposed to the U.S. where we have lower different financing structures and, and usually a lower value per kilowatt hour produced. So it does impact the economics and some of these decisions uh, that are being made uh, can be different based on those different economics and, um, and financing models. I can imagine. Uh, we have a question here. Um, thanks, uh, Cédric. We'll address the, the next question to uh, Ru again. Um, it's asked by a few people. And also at the conference, uh, Solo and I'm North America, we'll dive deeper into this. Um, we've sp you guys have speaking, uh, spoken so far about uh, larger scale O&M. Um, what would you say about the application of O&M? Uh, on residential scale portfolios and smaller systems, let's say below uh, or around 10 kilowatt peak? Um, good point. So the, the, the residential market, as you know, was uh, the, you know, the, the primary leader in, in our, our solar uh, industry. Uh, specifically here in the U.S., in California, we kicked off uh, with the residential systems. Uh, I look at them as one the same. Um, a, a two and a half or a three and a half kilowatt uh, residential system uh, that has nuances or a lack of attention to to O and M, uh, it's an investment that that requires. Uh, that I, let me step back a, a little. If someone was to pay fifteen to twenty thousand dollars for a motor vehicle, a brand new vehicle, they would implement an annual uh, maintenance budget by changing the spark plugs, the oil, and the filters. The same is so for residential solar systems. Uh, there was a global uh, entrepreneur that recently got up on a, a podium and stated that solar PV systems do not require any maintenance. You just point them at the sun and for 20 years they'll produce energy. Uh, that's great for my business that the people are saying that, but it's not true. Uh, these are uh, investments that uh, you know, residential homeowners are paying uh, 10, 20, 30, $40,000 or more and to just check the system annually and to wash it and to, to look after that asset so that it can indeed perform uh, you, you know, throughout the 20 year lifetime uh, and uh, create electricity uh, to, a, to a high level expectation. That can only be done by consideration to O&M protocols. So O&M in residential, absolutely just as important uh, as the utility scale and DG projects. And are you going to switch through with True South also to this segment? We are indeed. Uh, we're looking at it regionally. It's very hard to make it work on a, a three kilowatt system in Missouri, uh, but because my company's got such traction across the U.S. now, we can address an offering to the residential customers. Uh, we can make that one three kilowatt system part of 10,000 residential homes which we now uh, have under our O&M offering. Uh, so indeed we are going to uh, enter into the residential O&M offering. Thank you. Uh, because of time, I mean the, the, 
discussion is, is highly interesting, I think, and I re look really forward to the, the conference in a, in a month. We'll do uh, the last question for now, uh, which I want to ask to all three of you. Um, please keep the answer short and, and to the point. Um, which contractual guarantee uh, is, are normally envi uh, envisaged in O&M contracts? I would like to, you to point out the most important in your opinion. I'd like to start with Cedric, then Rue, and then Robert. Um, okay, short and to the point. Uh, it depends. Uh, the, usually there are guarantees that are included with the plant when it's built, and those can be either uh, production guarantees, typically weather corrected, or availability guarantees. You see less of those on the aftermarket once the, warrant, the, the initial EPC warranty has expired, uh, but those are the typical ones that you see out there. Thank you, Ru. Just so happens, it just so happens, Stefano, that the answer to mine is that the most common contractual obligation is also the most impactful that we see as the the uh, the negative, uh, which is the availability, uh, the system being able to perform and uh, turn photons into electrons. Uh, so that's the number one, followed closely by performance ratio, uh, of which we're measured for the kilowatt performance. Okay, I understand. So you would put availability on one. Robert, what is your comment on this? Yes, that's the same for me. Um, we see uh, PR guarantees mainly taken by EPC or provided by EPCs, but uh, from the O&M point of view, uh, technical availability, so not only time-based availability, but um, weighted by energy generation availability, that's the most common and the most important guarantee given by an O&M contractor. Clear. I want to uh, close off with, uh, with this. Uh, thank you for, uh, first of all, thank you for all three the, the panelists, Cedric, Robert and Rue for sharing your uh, expertise, your, your vision in this, uh, well, <laughs> rather short webinar. I hope for all the listeners that it's been uh, interesting and valuable and that it gives uh, at least a small express impression of what we will be discussing more in depth also at SODAR O&M North America on March 25 and 26 in San Francisco. Um, we will follow up with an email to everyone uh, with the slides that you have seen today, or perhaps you have not seen them because you ended later. Also the recordings. Uh, if there are any specific questions to the presenters, we'll be happy to forward these or to bring you in touch uh, directly. I look forward to uh, meeting uh, the three presenters also at the event later on in March. Uh, have all a great day and hope to stay in touch and see you at the end of March in San Francisco. Thank you.